To the left hand side for Vieira, who will play it through to Gabriel Jesus, who's in here for Arsenal. Gabriel Jesus to finish it off. Oh, and what a way to do it! Gabriel Jesus seals the points for Arsenal. He's back and he's back with a bang. Into the penalty area it goes. Gabriel header and it's into the back of the net. Arsenal take an early lead through Gabriel. You're listening to the Chronicles of Aguna, the daily Arsenal podcast with me, Harry Simeon. Hey everybody, how's it going? Welcome back to another episode of the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast with me, your host, Harry Simiou, coming to you this morning or this afternoon by the time I release it uh, from the German city of Dusseldorf. I took a four hour train ride to get back here last night from Stuttgart after Spain's victory over the hosts Germany at Euro 2024. That was probably the best game in the tournament so far and I'm so chuffed that I got to be there. It was an incredible experience. The journey there was fine. Um, It said on Google Maps and all the train apps that you can download that it would take two and a half hours and it took exactly two and a half hours to make the trip from Dusseldorf down to Stuttgart. However, the way back was an absolute nightmare. It was a disaster. You know, people say, and people always talk about German efficiency. I think, of course, that is valid in a lot of things. But where it's certainly not valid is when you're talking about their railway system. I had this impression that German railways would be really well organized, really well run, that everything would be on time, that everything would run like clockwork. And that is simply not the case. I got a train back from Stuttgart last night that was supposed to leave at 9.36 and get me home at just after midnight so get me back to Stuttgart just after midnight and you know what time we got back gone 2 a.m gone 2 a.m the train was jam-packed we didn't even get seats on the train I had no idea that you need to book the seats in advance Um, that's not how it works in England a lot of the time I know that you can book seats on certain trains etc etc but I just wasn't aware of it. We got to the station. We got on this jam-packed train. We had to stand where the luggage goes. If you follow me on social media, you might have seen a picture of me sitting on the floor underneath the luggage shelf because there was just nowhere to sit. And I was so tired. And the idea of standing there for what turned out to be a four-hour ride because we kept getting to certain stations, stopping for an absolute age. There were announcements over the tannoy on the train, but my German's not very good, so I couldn't figure out what the problems were or what the issues were but basically um, it took us four hours when really it should have taken uh, a little over three so yeah it was uh, it was a tough uh, ride back we got back um, we got something to eat we went to bed and we got up rather late today as a result of that but I am in Dusseldorf where of course it is buzzing today because England are in action here in their quarterfinal against Switzerland. Now, we'll bring you some reaction to that game on tomorrow's episode, of course. Um, but, you know, sometimes you have these thoughts, right? So sometimes you have things in your mind of of how things are going to look or how things are going to go. So I was expecting most of the chaos and carnage in Dusseldorf over this next 24 hours to be caused by England fans. Um, but actually, the Swiss, you know what, they give as good as they get. There was a group of them on our train last night. And they were literally singing the whole way. And when we got off at Dusseldorf as main station to get a taxi back to the hotel, um, they were making a right old racket at three, two, two, three o'clock in the morning, whatever it was. And and they were having a really, really good time. So, um, yeah, they're going to give as good as they get in the city. Uh, I'm sure it's not that long of a journey as well for them uh, in comparison. So, yeah, they're going to be here in their numbers, I'm sure. But anyway, that's not what we're here to talk about on today's episode. I'm sure you want to hear an update on Ricardo Calafiori. Um, I'm sure you want to hear me talk a little bit about William Saliba's performance last night for the French. Now, I didn't watch the game in full because I was on a train and I had signal for a lot of the way. Uh, therefore, I was able to watch it on my phone. But there was a lot of the journey where the signal was really, really ropey, wasn't working. 
and I, it was just impossible for me to do so. But from what I saw, which was probably around about 60 odd minutes of the game in full, William Saliba was just incredible again, wasn't he? Um, so calm, so solid, so uh, chilled. And that calmness and aura that he brings, it's just, it, it, it's kind of like contagious, isn't it? Because it spreads across that French defence and it helps them to all remain calm, to all stay focused, to all stay in the right positions, to maintain a really, really strong defensive line. And I know people will look at the French and say, well, they're not scoring goals at this competition. And that's a major, major problem. Of course it is. But as we've discussed with England in the past, if you've got a solid defence and you get that part of the game right, then you always stand a chance. And the French are in the semi-finals. Um, you know, having what, not even scored an o a goal from open play, I believe, which is incredible, really, when you think about it. I was at their game against Belgium. Um, I wasn't impressed uh, in that, really. The goal that they got was from open play, but of course it went down as a Jan Vertonghen OG, um, which is why people are saying that France haven't scored a goal in open play. They didn't impress me in an attacking sense. And I've said before that I think the balance in their attack isn't quite right. Just as it is in England, I don't think that Kylian Mbappe and uh, Marcus Turam works really. I think that you probably want to get Olivier Giroud into the side. You know that he's got previous in terms of his relationship with both Mbappe and Griezmann, who Didier Deschamps will want to have in the team for obvious reasons. Kylian Mbappe hasn't been very good at the competition either. Um, but William Saliba did an excellent job yesterday of pocketing someone that I think it's very, very clear now is over the hill and has had his best days. And I don't mean that in a disrespectful way because Cristiano Ronaldo has been one of football's greats. There is no doubt about that whatsoever. But there was a video that went up on the 90 Min Instagram account, a clip from our show the other day, in which I said we've now gotten to the point where Cristiano Ronaldo is more of a problem than he is a positive because... He is who he is and he demands a certain level of respect. And as a result of that, I felt like at times Portugal were so overly focused on working every bit of play through him that they ended up in a situation where um, they just weren't anywhere near as effective as they should be, given the attacking quality they have within their ranks. And you would not believe some of the comments that I got um, in, in response to that clip going out. And listen, I'm used to it. I've got much thicker skin than that. I don't really take it seriously. But I did have a good laugh at some of them last night after Cristiano Ronaldo dropped another stinker at Euro 2024. Uh, it was all sorts. It was, oh, what does this overweight guy know about football? What does this idiot know about football? Why don't you start up front for Portugal? All that kind of crap. Um and uh, yeah, it, well, I guess it turns out that actually Cristiano Ronaldo isn't the Cristiano Ronaldo of uh, yesteryear, which we all pretty much knew it just needed uh, a bit more convincing or some of those people needed a bit more convincing because of their unwavering loyalty to the player, which is weird to me. Like you can say that someone was and is one of the game's greats without believing that at approaching 40 years old, he's still the same player that he was. Nobody's sitting there saying he's the sole purpose and sole reason that Portugal haven't made it through. But, you know, you you, you got to be re realistic and fair about where Cristiano Ronaldo is today in comparison to where he was uh, a, a number of years ago. And I don't think there's anything wrong with saying that. Um, but yeah, look, William Saliba, from an Arsenal perspective, was the story yesterday. Another standout performance. It's mad to think, isn't it, that... Deschamps not that long ago was talking about Saliba as someone that um, doesn't do um, everything that he wants him to do at international level. This is what Didier Deschamps said about William Saliba back in March. Now, listen, again, you know, people change their minds. That's how the world works. There's no issue with that, really. But this is what he said. He said, he does things that I don't like so much. For France, he has limited game time. But when he's played... That hasn't necessarily gone well. Now, obviously, since the tournament's begun, he has played every single minute for France. Didier Deschamps in the lead up to the tournament, obviously having a change of heart around that. And he's conceded zero goals. So, you know, fair play to William Saliba for shutting people up, including his manager, 
for changing his manager's opinion of him. But also fair play to Didier Deschamps as well for not being like really stubborn about it. Like it's been obvious for a, a good while now that William Saliba is one of, if not the best centre backs in world football on current form. And so there's no reason why he shouldn't be in the team. And he is justifying that selection with these incredible performances. And I'm loving what we're seeing from him. Like in an ideal world, listen, I want our players to come back nice and early. Um, we get Kai Havertz back early now because of obviously what happened to Germany yesterday. Um, you know, and, and we'll, we'll touch on that game in a minute. But it's also great to see your players going really, really far at this level and on this stage. And you know what that can do for their morale. I know that it probably means that he comes back to preseason training later than we'd like. And he might not even be available for the first weekend of the season. That can that can happen. But also the benefit of that player succeeding and doing really well, I think, is is an important one. And I think in a lot of ways the the morale boost that it can give the the rise in their stock that it can create a lot of the time outweighs the negative of them potentially being a few weeks behind the rest in terms of regaining their match fitness the other thing is people always talk about this they say well they're going to need to build themselves up for the new season if they're at match fitness level now obviously they're going to have a break but that break is going to be shorter than the break that some of the others have had therefore are they as far behind in terms of match fitness? Probably not. It's probably less of an effort to make that up because of the fact that, you know, your break was shorter and so your condition has deteriorated less over that period of time. Just back to the Germany-Spain game, though. Um, as I said, I think it was easily the best game of the tournament so far and, and what an honour it was to, to be in attendance. Kai Havertz, I got a lot of shit on Twitter yesterday for saying at half time that I thought he'd been a little bit frustrating. Now, that wasn't me digging out Kai Havertz above everybody else in that German side. That was me paying particular attention to the player that plays for my club, which I think is perfectly natural. Kai Havertz had a couple of opportunities in the first period. There was a header, which was quite difficult because there wasn't an awful lot of power on the cross and it was difficult to generate it. And then there was another effort where he brought the ball down beautifully out of the air and he tried to sort of reverse finish and, and he just never really got a hold of the shot. So look, he was involved and he was in a lot more involved at that stage in the game than most German players. But with Kai Havertz, you know, people were sort of leaping to his defense and saying, well, you know, the movement to get into those situations is excellent. And I've always been quite a staunch defender of Kai Havertz. But, you know, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to sometimes zoom out when we're talking about Kai Havertz and say, yes, brilliant movement, always involved in the build-up, a real asset in that sense, but not the clinical finisher that you want him to be. Like, And, and that's my thing with Kai Havertz. Like, I, I watched him yesterday. There was another opportunity, which was a glorious opportunity when Germany were a goal down to chip the goalkeeper, he opted to go for that option and he tried to dink it over Unai Simon and he just couldn't keep the effort down and it went over the bar. But he had an option to his right. And, you know, had he delayed a split second and, and squared it, then maybe Germany would have equalised at a much earlier stage. And maybe with the momentum... And the wind in their sails, they would have gone on to win the game before it went to extra time. I don't know. This is all speculation, right? You, you, you can't possibly know that. But what I do know is that, that Kai Havertz isn't this clinical finisher that some people want him to be. And I was sitting among a group of German journalists yesterday who were talking to me about Kai Havertz and who were incredibly frustrated with the fact that his all-round game is so good, apart from sometimes having that clinical edge when it really, really matters. And look, it is what it is. Like, I'm not sticking the boot in on Kai Havertz. It's a trade-off, right? If you want better movement and you want someone who can drop deep and get involved in build-up play, but then also has the ability to run in behind teams in the way that Kai Havertz does, then you have to trade that off against the fact that he's not the most clinical finisher. There are other players who probably are more clinical in front of goal and in those types of situations, but wouldn't give you anywhere near as much in the build-up. So I'm not criticizing Kai Havertz. What I'm saying is, is that by now people should know what he is and people shouldn't get offended when someone says, actually, he's not a ruthless finisher because the truth is he isn't. That's the reality of the situation. 
So, yeah, nobody needs to get precious about it. Like, yes, we're Arsenal fans and we're going to defend our player, as we should. But I'll defend him on the basis that his overall game is very good, not on the basis that he's a clinical finisher. Because to sit there and peddle that narrative is just wrong because it's a lie. It's not true. We all know it. We've seen it with our own eyes. Anyway, glad he's coming back and glad he'll be uh, hopefully um, ready not too far into the new season to pick up where he left off last season where he had a really, really good campaign for the Arsenal. Right, it's time for the update then on Riccardo Calafiori, the Italian international who is said to have rejected Chelsea um, in the sense of his people made it very clear apparently that Arsenal is the only place for him. And what I find really uh, strange about this whole Calafiori thing is that I'm hearing a lot of people say, well, you know, it's because of his performances at the Euros that Arsenal are going in to sign him when that is simply not true. Arsenal would have been looking at this player for a really long time. Arsenal would have been well aware of the work that he was doing at Bologna. Um, Fabrizio Romano uh, has been saying that Arsenal staff have been following him really, really closely for a long time or well aware of his qualities and that Arsenal, you know, looking for someone who's a sort of left centre-back slash left-back profile, which is what we've gone for on the right-hand side, identified him as a good option really, really early on. And actually what the Euros have done is just cemented that interest have convinced people further that this is the right move and this is the right player to bring in none of us were aware of that interest prior to the euros which i think is um indicative again of of how good arsenal have got at keeping things quiet and doing things um you know quietly behind the scenes and in the shadows if you like um but it does feel like this is slowly but surely moving forward towards some kind of conclusion now this is not my information and i wouldn't ever claim it to be but um i posted the other day and i actually got some flack for that as well it's mad um no you don't know nothing blah, blah blah i never said i knew anything all i said was that speaking to some of my italian colleagues who i'm out here in germany with um as far as they were aware bologna hadn't accepted an offer for ricardo calafiori yet that personal terms were not going to be an issue there's rumors that we're going to look to pay him at around about four million uh, per year, um, which four million per year, if you divide it by the number of weeks, works out at about seventy seven thousand. That's four million euros per year. So it works out about seventy seven thousand euros per week, which isn't an outrageous salary, really, when you think about what we're currently paying to other players. Now, that is very competitive in terms of what the Italian clubs could offer in comparison, which is why we've got an advantage here. But it sounds like from what we're reading and what we're hearing that Riccardo Calafiori is really interested in the Arsenal project, has been really impressed by it, and he's really interested in linking up and working with Mikel Arteta, who's been following him for a long time. But the state of play currently, and hopefully this doesn't change by the time I get to release this episode, is that Arsenal are in negotiations now with Bologna. The bit between Arsenal and Calafiori seems to be, if not completely finalised, close to being uh, finalised. But the bit between Arsenal and Bologna still requires some work. Now, they're looking for around about 50 uh, million euros. And that's because, uh, as Fabrizio Romano said, anything over 4 million, um, which is what they bought him from Basel for, Basel are entitled to take 50%. So Bologna want to make sure that they get their chunk as well and that they look after themselves in this as well as the Swiss club who have had an absolute touch here and result here, haven't they? But anyway, um, that's the latest on Ricardo Calafiori. Um, we'll talk more Arsenal tomorrow, of course, and we'll fold some of the England chat into that as well. I did watch Nico Williams in the flesh uh, yesterday as well, but um, I will bring you some thoughts on him uh, in tomorrow's episode because um, I feel like there are certain parts of that game that I want to watch back before I go big on my opinion on Nico Williams. You know me. I don't like to throw something out unless I really believe it. Uh, like and subscribe, share all the rest of it. You know the drill by now. And I will see you all on the next one. Until then, take care of yourselves. Have a great day. Goodbye.